In the previous step, we talked about fundamental um, or simple structural elements of Spring and Dashbot. In this third step, we are going to talk about um, fundamental, not structural, but material elements, but these are not in the uh, literature called material elements. They have a different name. They are called rheological elements. So here the uh, keyword is rheological versus structural. It reminds ourselves that we are now going to do some type of modeling of a behavior that doesn't have a structural connotation, but it has it pertains to fundamental material behavior. And therefore, all the constants that eventually will appear in my model will actually be material constants. Um, so rheology, by the way, means the study of how things flow. Um, and so that's going to remind us that we are at the now material level. So a fundamental here, on the other hand, refers to two special types of behavior. The first behavior is the behavior of a pure or idealized elastic solid. And the second behavior is associated with a pure or idealized viscous fluid behavior. Um, so when we eventually build rheological elements or models, I'm going to again draw pictures. And when I draw these pictures, I'm going to be motivated by the pictures that I've seen at the structural level because I understand it reminds me immediately something. For instance, when I draw a spring, I know that that has to do with elasticity. When I draw a dashpot, I know that that has to do with viscosity. Now, a spring and a dashpot, respect, respectively, they are structural level elements, okay? But in this context, the way I'm going to draw them is going to be slightly different. So when I see this, I will remember that this is a, actually a rheological element. Um, nevertheless, I'm, we are keeping the same names because of their meaning, that, that, that what they remind us is very fundamental, okay? Um, so, so the first element, rheological element we're going to talk about is therefore one that represents pure elastic solid behavior. Um, so and that's going to be a spring and that's the way I am going to draw it. Now remember that now we're at the structural level. So because we, I'm sorry, we are at the material level. And because we are at the material level, displacement doesn't make sense. The material responds to strain or the rate of the strain, right? For instance, viscous fluid to the shear rate, this one to the amount of strain epsilon. So when I put, when I deform this spring, quote unquote, the spring, which is a rheological element, is just something to remind me about the, about the underlying material behavior. The amount of deformation is not going to be displacement. That doesn't really matter how much I displace something. Stress is proportional not to displacement, but to strain. And therefore, here I will pull it with strain. And the constant that appears here is going to be not a structural, but because I'm at the material level, it's a material, actually, constant, a material parameter. And the resulting behavior is going to be indicated with stress, not force, because again, I'm at the material level. And this is a behavior that reminds me, because of this picture, of a elastic type material behavior. In other words, the stress that results from this is simply Young's modulus times the resulting strain or the strain that we impose. So the second case, in this particular case, the way we will draw the picture is again, I will have some uh, element that's going to be loaded in some way, but that really just reminds us of material behavior. So the loading is now not going to be through strain, but actually the strain rate, because that's what viscous fluids are sensitive to. So notice now, uh, I am in 1D, and in 1D, I am going to only work with strain. So this is a concept that we haven't seen before. Epsilon indicates normal strain. Well, Viscous fluid responds not to normal strain, 
but to essentially shear strain, right? The rate of the shear strain. But now, again, this is just the motivation for what that reminds us. Ultimately, I'm in 1D, and it turns out that there are materials like polymers which respond not only to the amount of normal strain, but how fast you deform it, how fast the normal strain changes. So now, because I'm in 1D, I just pick epsilon. I could have picked both of them to be gamma. Many of the discussions would carry over. In other words, my one dimension would have to do with the relation between shear stress and amount of shear strain and a contribution from the rate of shear strain or the shear rate. But I'm sticking to the normal quantity. So again, however, I'll just put a quantity here, eta, that reminds us of viscosity, and it's going to be called viscosity. And such a structural element, a dashpot, delivers a material behavior, it reminds me of a material behavior where the stress is proportional to the rate of strain through the viscosity constant eta. So here, uh, E and eta, again, remember, these are material constants now. And there is no picture like this at the material level. I don't see a dashpot or a spring when I zoom into a material's microstructure. These are just reminding us of how idealized um, pure elastic solid or a pure, in this case, a viscous solid behaves like. Okay, so this is a now a, let's write it. Pure or idealized elastic solid. And this is a pure viscous solid okay solid behavior that is represented pictorially like this so it is worth again and again and again emphasizing that what i have are only graphical reminders or mnemonics if you like reminders of the underlying material behavior so in other words they are not structural elements okay their dimensions have absolutely no meaning just what they imply as the relation between stress and strain or strain rate is important um, so these are now two fundamental rheological elements that indicate individually what special types of material behavior could be. Now, I'm going to, just as I did before, I can combine them to write material models that are neither pure viscous solid or a pure elastic solid, but some combination thereof. So, for instance, I could write a very simple um, viscoelastic material model. And it's the first one that we are now going to encounter. Okay. So, and that viscoelastic model is going to be constructed um, from these pictures. I could go ahead and directly write it, but once I have a picture, then that picture will imply the relation between stress and strain and strain rate. Um, and moreover, depending on the complexity of, of the picture, which is not very hard to draw, I can make it easily graphically as complicated as I want. The resulting behavior, however, may not be always very easily um, um, expressible analytically. So the pictorial starting point is preferable over a direct, um, let me say, proposal for the relation between stress and strain and, of, and strain rate as a mathematical function. The starting point, the preferable point, is the pictorial statement. The pictorial statement will rest on these structural elements. The idea is, I have two fundamental modes of, let me say, material behavior. Uh, rheological elements represent them. If I take several of them and combine them in some special way, perhaps I could take I could eventually obtain a behavior that is neither this or that, in other words, viscoelastic. You can imagine that I can take many of each and combine them in many different ways to come up with many different kinds of viscoelastic material model. I'm going to write one that is very fundamental 
um, and similar to the one that I just wrote at the structural level, namely where I take a dash pot and a spring and I connect them in parallel. Okay, so, so there's going to be a Young's modulus and a viscosity and the outcome is going to be subjected to some deformation. Now, instead of writing strain and the rate of strain, strain explicitly, I'm just going to write the strain as a function of time, which suggests that strain is not a constant, it's not a given amount. So over time it will increase in value and the rate at which it changes might also be different for different functions of epsilon as a function of time. So this function epsilon of time, t, uh, is now one that incorporates all the information associated with the amount of deformation and the rate of deformation, which, which would be simply the time derivative of that. And the question I ask is very simple. Well, if I have such a material that is pictorially represented like this through fundamental rheological elements, what is the met combined outcome, the scholastic material model? Um, in other words, for a given function of strain as a function of time, what is the resulting stress as a function of time? Well, how do I find that stress? Well, well, the only thing you have to do is you have to realize that the stress is a combination of two portions. One, there is a combination from the elastic spring, okay, the solid part, and that's in parallel with the other part, so that's the viscous part. This part is essentially equal to a Young's modulus times epsilon, the second part is a viscosity times the strain rate, and that's it, okay? So that is now a viscoelastic material model. Why is the material model? What is it that indicates us that we are at the material level? Well, one, we see strain, not displacements or whatever, and two, all the parameters that appear, they are material parameters. They don't have to do with dimensions of the structure. So this type of behavior now is neither a elastic or a viscous behavior. It's a viscoelastic material behavior and it applies if you have such a material behavior to any type of application of this material in any type of structural um, scenario. Okay, so now however the question to ask is well is this a good viscoelastic material model? So in other words in experiments I know what viscoelastic material behavior looks like. And that behavior is quantified through experiments. I have some experimental input. Now, remember, Always the idea in modeling material behavior is you have some experimental input so which says that in this case okay I give this amount of deformation over this sort of time dependence and this is the stress behavior I observe. And now you like to predict that. In other words if you gave this, give the same epsilon as a function of time into your model you'd like to have a stress prediction that matches the input from the or the data from the experiment. So the question is is this a good is it a good uh, model of what of viscoelastic material behavior? So the experiment has data and on the other hand our model makes a theoretical prediction and the question is do they match in terms of the observed viscoelastic material behavior? If I can match fundamental experimental data and observations with this model, this is a good model. If I cannot, it's not a good model. I have to improve upon it. So in our next step, we're going to assess that.